Welcome back to my channel. It's been a long time since my last video. I know a few of the guys on YouTube are asking how my tank's getting on. And to be honest with you, I've got a completely new tank. Um, the old one is now in my garage, so sat there sort of collecting dust. Um, we ended up changing the house around a little bit. And the new tank is, uh, is not a peninsula, so I do miss I do miss that actually, um, but I've got a, a Red Sea Reefer 350, which is a very good tank. I have had the old Red Sea uh, Red Sea Max, and I've had some Red Sea Nanos. So yeah, I've always been a fan of the Red Sea Reefer tanks. So yeah, I uh, ended up changing over to that one. It's roughly the same size. So my last system was about 350 liters, and so is this one. And it was purely to change the room size around. So. That being said, let's go and talk about where we're at. So I wanted to start off with talking about the successes and failure of the, the custom build Peninsula that I shut down um, before we before we sort of start the journey from the, the 350, uh, the Red Sea 350. So I suppose let's start with the failures because realistically I watch a lot of YouTube channels and I've learned a lot from other people's mistakes so hopefully you can learn a lot from my mistakes as well as my success um, so it has been a mixed bag in the last one uh, I don't know if I um, I said this in the in the previous videos or not but I ended up getting a, a bad outbreak of ick on most of my fish um, and I probably lost about 80% of them I lost everything apart from a a blue damsel and my Picasso, is it a Picasso? No, Snowflake uh, Clown, which I've had for about five or six years, so I was glad I didn't lose him, but pretty much every other fish, unfortunately, was lost. So that taught me a few valuable lessons, and if that wasn't bad enough, I then got a case of Cyano and Dinos. So not just one, I got both of them. So that was a that was probably more frustrating than the the ick because I think I feel like with ick you know that it's a parasite it lives on the fish you know how you get it by not quarantining or you know it's brought in on something else the fish get it when they're stressed and you know there's ways to cure it you can take your fish out you can do copper treatments and things if you get it quick enough whereas the thing with dinos there seems to be a lot of mystery about how how you get it. You know, you get it when nutrients are too low, or someone else will say you get it when nutrients nutrients are too high. And it seems there's still a lot of grey area that we don't know about it. And when it comes to battling it, that makes it extremely difficult because you've got lots of different opinions, and none of them are or have been proven yet. So. I ended up trying lots of different things to, to try and rectify it. I ended up raising nutrients very high, getting lots of algae, didn't work. The cyano and the dinos just got worse. I then started slowly removing my sand bed, which uh, did work actually, reduced all of it, but it was still there and still present. And then finally, I tried something called, called the elegant corals uh, method of removing it, which it stressed my corals out a bit actually but it sort of subsided for a little while and then came back so I did it again and it came back so I sort of developed my own way of dealing with it it's a combination of different things that I've read and something that I thought is useful I've got a certain type of dinos I, I had a certain type of dinos which move freely in the water so if they can't um, if you know if you do a blackout for instance and they're not getting the light or the conditions aren't ideal for that particular dinoflagellate it will move around trying to find a better spot so what I did was I left the sump light on 24 hours a day I did a full blackout on my um, on my, my tank my main tank and then I noticed that the the dinos were migrating to where the sump was because that was obviously a better place for them to grow at that point once they were all in there, so I did a four day blackout, once they were all migrated, I turned the lights on, on my tank and they sort of stayed in the sump area 
and let my corals roam around free and, and be happy and start to recover from the damage that was already done. What I then did to try and eliminate the the dinos, because they were all stuck in an area where I can safely overdose certain chemicals and things without it affecting my corals too much, I turned off the, uh, the return pump and, and stopped the flow to the tank. And every day I would dose about five to 10 times the amount of hydrogen peroxide that is required for my entire tank, but I'll dose it just to this tiny little area of the sump, which is probably only got five or ten liters of wa water in it, but a whole heap of dinos and cyano, and watch it disintegrate. Really, uh, I'd leave it for an hour or two, then get a uh, get a, a pump, get all the water out, get all the hydrogen peroxide out, and the, and the dead um, bacteria and things that are in there, fill it fresh with water. Do that once again, and then turn the return pump on, let it circle the um, you know the tank and because I'd already removed it and diluted and removed any of the leftovers doing that for a couple of weeks that sort of got rid of the entire the entire issue actually so I was pretty happy with that because I had been battling it for months that was um, one of the disheartening things about it so that was a, I suppose a failure and a success all in one it was a good learning curve so I know in the future if I ever have that issue that there is a way to beat it and there, is, uh, there are methods out there to, to do it. So if you want to know in depth exactly how I did it, or if you're having a similar issue, just let me know in the comments and I'll, I'll create a separate video with step-by-step -step instructions of exactly what I did. So the next thing I wanted to talk about are some of the successes. So, you know, I had a bit of a tough time with some of the failures. Lost a fair bit of money's worth of fish and, you know, I lost a fair few corals as well. But the successes outweigh the failures, which is why I'm still doing it. And some of the successes that I had, uh, this is the first tank that I successfully kept SPS. I never really had any luck previously. My knowledge of reef keeping wasn't what it is now. Uh, I still got a long way to go and I'm still learning things every day. That's probably why, uh, you know, that's probably why most people like the hobby. It's, it's quite challenging. But yeah I care this is the first time I've kept SPS and not only kept them you know I've done pretty well I've grown most of them out from tiny little frags to um, you know fist size in less than a year despite all the issues that I've had they've been pretty steady so much so that I'm probably looking to reduce the amount of LPS that I've got in the tank and increase the amount of SPS the I like the I like the challenge of keeping SPS, but I also like the growth rate as well. So there's certain LPS like my frog spawns and things that I've got, which you know you can physically see that they've got a lot bigger uh, my chalice corals. But the growth rate of SPS is definitely something that I wanna I wanna pursue. Um, I may even set up a separate tank and have one um, for LPS and softies and one for SPS because what I'm finding at the minute which we'll go over in detail in a future video but I'm, I'm struggling to to keep everything in the tank happy especially being such a small tank you know you really want to be able to crank the flow up at the top of the, the tank for the SPS so it keeps them happy but as anyone knows who keeps a, a mixed reef tank that if you have LPS and they're getting blasted by by flow they don't like it they don't open up properly um, same goes for light as well to keep, to keep the color of certain corals, especially high-end SPS. A lot of them need pretty high par value. And then, you know, when I, if I've got a mushroom that's growing up a, a, a rock and, and reaching uh, the middle of the tank, they're just getting blasted with light and they're not opening up properly. Whereas that exact same mushroom in the corner of the tank where the light is less intense, you can see it's opening up fully and, and growing well. So it's pretty obvious that the restrictions of a small tank a small pretty shallow tank um, trying to keep a mixed reef is something that I will probably never do again if I'm going to keep a mixed reef it needs to be much deeper at least two foot and potentially I'd like it to be um, to wider as well and, and again two foot so I think 60 60 by you know however long four four foot would be the minimum for me but I'd like to have a six or an eight foot 
uh, tank. So probably six foot by two foot by two foot is the perfect dimension. So once this one's grown out fully, I'll probably look into to getting a, a slightly larger upgrade, but I can't imagine I'd ever go bigger than that, <laughs> which is what they all say. That's what I said about the last one, but I'm already thinking about it. Let's see how we go with this one first. So let's talk about some of the other successes that I've had. And one of the big success um, stories that I've got really is the amount of money that I saved by doing a DIY job. It's still going strong. I can continue to use it if I wanted to. Um, I mean, the the cabinet was getting a, a bit battered. I'd probably have used what well, on the on the back of the cabinet. I used the MDF material, and it started to swell. Uh, and the on the front doors and things, I used a marine plywood, so they were all fine. But yeah, if I could go back and change it, I probably used a um, a plywood rather than an MDF back. But everything else, you know. I DIY'd my refugium lights. I had to take it offline at one point because it was just stripping all the water of nu nutrients and my corals were, were starving basically. So I've taken that offline now for the, for the new tank. I don't need it anymore. I have to dose to, to keep up with the requirements. Uh, I feed extra now, so I feed four cubes of uh, mysis or brine a day. And then I also dose about, um, I think it's about two parts per million nitrate. And the reason I dose nitrate and don't do uh, dose phosphate is because my nitrate seems to bottom out each time, but my phosphates are still there. So because I'm using in the in the new system, instead of using refugium, I'm using a, a nopox carbon. I need to increase the the nitrate manually to keep it in um, keep it in ratio with the phosphate. So when the bacteria are trying to consume the you know the nutrients that are in the system and, and live they're not limited by one or the other you know so there's there's enough in there to there's enough nitrate and phosphates in there for them to have basic metabolic functions and the final thing I want to talk about in this video is purely the fact that I managed to you know move across the to a new system without too many hassles. It's not like I had to move house or anything. It was in the same house, so that makes it a lot easier. But still, I expected there to be a few um, mortalities, or I'll lose lose a few of the finicky corals. But everything came across well. Um, I, that's down really to using the well. First things first is getting rid of all the the problems that I had with cyano and dinos before I attempted to migrate to a new tank. I think if I did it a different way, it would have been a much uh, bigger problem because if corals are stressed out. And they've got the added stress of, um, you know, moving them to a new system as well as, you know, cyano growing all over it. Then it's probably going to be the end of it. So future plans. Um, I'm going to stick on some T5 lighting, and I'm potentially going to get the GHL ion director. So I've already got the the KH director, which we'll talk about in a future video because I'm going to go through the entire setup of how it all runs. Um, but yeah, that's the, the two pieces of equipment that I'm looking at currently. And going forward, I know I said this before, but I, this time I definitely mean it. I'm going to try and do much shorter, um, much shorter, more frequent videos for, for you guys and for myself as well. So I can record any problems and changes. I can always go back. If I, if I record the log of what I'm doing on, on YouTube and I see... I'm running into issues I can always go back and refer to it so I encourage anyone who's got a, a reef tank to try and make these sorts of videos if possible and uh, I'm gonna try and practice what I preach this time and uh, keep on top of it so if you're with me this long then thank you I know it's a long video uh, but I had a lot to cover in the last year and um, I'll see you in the next one